Hey guys, welcome to the chapter 13 lecture. Brace yourselves, because this one is a doozy. So this chapter, whoops, let's move my face, is all about the adaptive immune response, also known as the third line of defense. So if you recall, the first line of defense was just physical and chemical barriers, like skin and tears and sweat is the first line of defense. The second line of defense is the innate immune system, which is made up of a bunch of phagocytes like neutrophils and macrophages that release a bunch of cytokines that stimulate inflammation. So those are the key components of the second line or innate immune response. This chapter focuses all on the third line of defense, which we call the adaptive or acquired immune response. And that's because it's the leg or arm of the immune system that actually can learn and has memory and has very specifically targets um, different pathogens. So it's specific and it has memory are two of the key features of this um, line of defense. The key cells are the main players in this um, adaptive or acquired immunity are B cells and T cells, and we will talk about them in detail. Both B cells and T cells are a class of white blood cells known as lymphocytes. So your lymphocytes are your B cells and your T cells. So <clears throat> B cells and T cells, I'm not sure where to put my face in this one. No, oh, well, we'll put it down here. Um, B cells and T cells recognize very specific sort of signatures on the surface of cells. So we've talked about markers and in the previous chapter we talked about um, phagocytes recognizing PAMPs, um, pathogen associated molecular patterns. These are very generalized patterns like double-stranded RNA. Doesn't matter what that sequence is of the RNA is, it just matters that the structure is double-stranded and that's a molecular pattern that our phagocytes can recognize as foreign all right these PAMPs PAMPs are general patterns that stimulate phagocytes of the innate immune system antigens are more specific and antigen the word antigen also sometimes we use the word immunogen, but antigen is much more common, is basically anything that stimulates B and T cells. And these are much smaller, much more specific patterns that are recognized. So um, if you have a molecule, for example, this big yellow ball with things sticking off of it, all right, this whole thing is the antigen. This is the thing that antibodies are recognizing that B and T cells will recognize. All right, the specific spots on that antigen that they recognize or bind to are called the epitopes. So an antigen is any molecule that stimulates B and T cells that they recognize and bind to. And those little spots on the antigen that they recognize are called epitopes. So a single antigen can have multiple epitopes and meaning that a single antigen can have multiple antibodies that recognize it. Um, and uh, a good antigen, something that makes a good antigen is gonna be something usually that's made of a protein, something that has sort of a complex shape, usually something fairly large. So really small proteins don't make very good antigens. Um, carbohydrates and lipids don't make great antigens. And this is important when we talk about vaccine design, knowing what makes a good antigen versus a bad antigen. But of course, microbes are made up of plenty of proteins and other molecules. So a microbe usually comes with tons of antigens. The difference between antigens and PAMPs is something really important to understand. PAMPs being general, antigens being specific patterns, and the PAMPs stimulate the second line of defense, our phagocytes, and antigens stimulate the third line of defense, which contains our lymphocytes, B and T cells. So a little bit more about these antigens. Antigens can come in different flavors. 
We call these alloantigens. So for example, a classic example are the surface molecules on the flu virus. You hear about flu viruses like H1N1, H3N2, H5N9. The H stands for hemagglutinin and N stands for neuraminidase. And these are just two surface molecules that are antigens that the immune system recognizes and mounts an immune response to, but they come in different flavors. So there's like nine different flavors of each, which is why you have H1N1 and H3N2. They both have H and N proteins on the surface, but they're different versions of the H and N or different flavors. So we call these alloantigens. When you have an antigen that comes in different varieties, then those are considered alloantigens. A super antigen is, so an antigen, of course, is anything that stimulates B and T cells. So super antigens super stimulate B and T cells and overstimulate them. Um, and they do that. So a regular antigen in this picture down here, we're showing um, part of the immune response called antigen presentation, where an antigen is being presented by, let's say, a macrophage to a T cell. And this is the normal way that it presents it, receptor to receptor. But super antigens sort of lock the receptors together, so you get super stimulation of the T cell, which results in a chain reaction that super stimulates other arms of the immune system. And this can lead to toxic shock. So super antigens are particularly dangerous because they overstimulate our immune system to a point where it actually damages us. Allergens that cause allergies are a type of antigen. We give them sort of a separate category because allergic reactions are a type of immune response, but it's a separate type of response. It's a very different type of response than what we get to pathogens. So we'll talk all about allergens in chapter 14. So we're going to talk about the stages of this third line of defense, the adaptive immune response. I'm just gonna give you an overview now and then we're gonna talk about each of these stages in detail. So the first thing that has to happen is your lymphocytes, your B and T cells, need to develop and differentiate. They start off as little tiny baby stem cells in the bone marrow and then they grow up and mature into teenage lymphocytes that are ready to go out in the world and do their thing, all right? The, second stage of the immune response so these teenagers that are mature they're they're physically matured but they don't have any experience yet they haven't experienced antigen yet so they are naive and so the next thing they need the next stage of their life is to be presented with antigen stage two antigen presentation and during this stage um, innate immune cells that gobbled up bacteria back in the second line of defense present antigen to these um, naive cells and activate them. Then once they're activated, they can go do their thing. That's step three. The, when they are doing their thing, we call that their effector functions. So B cells, when they are activated, their effector response is to make antibodies. And T cells, there's actually a bunch of different types of T cells. Um, that have different roles, but we call all of the T cell response cell mediated immunity. So we'll talk about all these things. So let's start with lymphocyte development. So your lymphocytes, like I said, start, I'm going to move my face again. They start um, all of your blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells. So your um, neutrophils, macrophages, eosinophils, lymphocytes, B cells, T cells, all of these develop in the bone marrow from progenitor stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow, right? Um, the ones that develop into lymphocytes will then leave the bone marrow. Um, some of them actually will stay in the bone marrow and they will mature into um, naive B cells. I call these this stage sort of like the baby stage and this sort of the teenage stage. So they're physically matured but they still are very naive. They haven't experienced the world and the body yet. So these guys will patrol around and wait for some experience. All right, they live primarily, they'll hang out primarily in the lymph nodes and the spleen. 
the baby lymphocytes, some of those baby lymphocytes though, will leave the blood, or sorry, the bone marrow, and migrate to the thymus, where they will mature into a different type of cell, a T cell. In fact, B and T come from the fact that B cells mature in the bone marrow, and T cells mature in the thymus. The thymus is that lymphoid organ that's right above the heart. It's sort of that fatty looking thing that sits on top of the heart. Um, and then those naive T cells, which I still consider sort of more like teenagers, naive teenagers, all right, also go to the lymph node and the spleen where they hang out and they wait to be presented with antigen and activated. So the cool thing about our lymphocytes is that each and every one is a little bit different and recognizes something a little bit different, recognizes a slightly different antigen. So um, each, every single B and T cell of the millions of B's and B and T cells that we have, each recognize a unique antigen. And this diversity is created genetically through genetic recombination that occurs in the lymphocytes during their development process in the bone marrow. And it's pretty cool. You don't have to um, be able to understand this in its entirety. This process of this genetic recombination is called VDJ recombination. So in other words, in the genetics of your B's and B and T cells, there are several genes for the V segment, several genes for the D segment, several for the J segment, and so on and so forth. And basically your cells can like copy and paste, mix and match these different gene segments do some splicing so that every time the cell divides, the new daughter cell has a different version of this receptor gene. So each and every lymphocyte, B and T cell, has a different receptor on its surface and is able to recognize a different antigen, which is awesome because that variety is what allows us to recognize lots of different pathogens and mount an immune response. So I like this number here. It's estimated that each human produces lymphocytes with 10 trillion different specificities. And no two people have the same B and T cells, even identical twins who have the same exact DNA sequences. Their cells will recombine those DNA sequences in different orders. So even two genetically identical clones, two identical twins, will have totally different B and T cells, which is why they might have totally different immune responses to different pathogens. It's kind of up to luck. So when your lymphocytes um, go through this process of, you know, creating their different receptors, um, not all of those receptors are great. And so the body has a system of sort of um, culling the populations of B and T cells before sending them out into the body to do their thing. So the first thing is, remember, the immune system's job is to recognize things that are foreign. So we don't want to keep around immune cells that recognize antigens in our body. That would not be good. You don't want a T cell that recognizes your liver and mounts an immune response to it. So the first stage in lymphocyte development is um, to delete any of the um, lymphocytes that actually recognize self. So the first stage is to present self antigens to these T cells and any of them that recognize that self ant antigen, they basically get triggered to self-destruct. Um, so this stage is called immune tolerance. We learn uh, our immune cells, the first thing they learn is to tolerate self. And this will also include some of our self, our, our normal flora, our microbes that are part of our body, essentially, that are normal flora. We develop immune tolerance to them. We don't mount an immune response to them because they're normal in our bodies. Um, the second stage is called clonal selection, and this happens when the B or T cells get activated, when there's actually antigen around, something for them, foreign for them to recognize, like bacterial antigen or a virus antigen, all right? Whichever one, whichever one of those clones um, recognizes the antigen, 
that's the one that gets selected. It's called clonal selection. So in this case, it's this guy right here. It recognizes the epitope of an antigen. And then that recognition causes it to proliferate and make lots of copies of itself. This is called clonal expansion. So all of these T cells, even though they have different receptors, they're all technically clones of each other. They're just copies. But the genetic difference lies only in the gene that codes for that receptor. They each mix and match that gene, so they have different receptors. So they're not clones in the sense that they're not, they're really not identical, but they're clones in the sense that they're all T cells. They all have the same functions, cellular functions. The only difference between them is that receptor on their surface. So clonal deletion is the process of deleting any lymphocytes that recognize self antigens, delete them from the population. Clonal selection is finding the right one that has the matching receptor to an antigen. And then clonal expansion is making lots and lots of copies of that B or T cell that matches the antigen. So I'm kind of blocking some stuff here. All right. Um, so all of our cells have markers on them to tell the immune cells, basically, so, so the immune cells have something to recognize as self. So the self markers um, are, are MHC markers. MHC stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex, and it's um, a group of genes that code for these markers, these proteins that stick off the surface of cells. So there's three classes, but we're gonna just focus on two, the two important classes of MHC molecules. MHC class one molecules. These are the self identifiers. These are found on all cells of the body, except for red blood cells. Red blood cells are kind of interesting exceptions to cells. They also don't have nuclei. They are non-nucleated cells. I like to think of them as kind of like drone cells. They're just like, they don't have a pilot. They're just, I don't know. Anyway, so red blood cells are the exception here. They're the only cells that do not have an MHC class one marker. Every other cell, your skin cells, your eye cells, your liver cells, your heart cells, your muscle cells, I'll keep going on and on, all have an MHC class one marker. All right. These um, MHC class one markers also can bind to antigen and present antigen. All right, for instance, if a cell, if your skin cell is infected with a virus, all right, some of those viral proteins can get attached to that MHC class one marker and hold it up to let the immune system know, hey, guys, over here, I'm infected with this virus. MHC class two markers, these are special markers, and these are specifically, like their job is to be professional, um, antigen presenters. And so they are only found on professional antigen presenting cells, which we call APCs. And we'll talk about what cells cl are classified as um, antigen presenting cells, but it's any of the ones that have an MHC class two marker. And that one's um, drawn here in brown. Notice that any cell that has an MHC class two will also have an MHC class one because all cells have MHC class one, except red blood cells. And so antigen presenting cells will have MHC class one, plus also they have MHC class two. And you can see the little antigen binding site. So this is going to be found on cells that are phagocytes, that can phagocytose things and swallow them and chew them up and then present them back out to B cells and T cells. Another name, FYI, for the MHC markers are HLA, human leukocyte antigen. Technically in humans, we call it HLA. In other organisms, we call it MHC. It can be kind of confusing. I'm gonna go with MHC. That's what the textbook goes with. Um, but in other classes, you may at some point learn about HLA markers. It's the same thing. So MHC, uh, before I change the slide, it's, um, it is a marker that identifies ourself, so it's also the 
part of our cells that's recognized as foreign in transplant situations. So if my husband wanted to give me his kidney, I don't know if he could. He could only do it if we have matching MHC markers. Um, and so when people are matched to see if they're a good match for transplants, it's different than um, blood groups because red blood cells don't have MHC, so that's why we have different, we talk about the ABO blood groups. All right, but for tissue donation or organ donation, it's the MHC class one markers that have to be matched. These are a type of alloantigen. There's lots of different versions or flavors of MHC class one, and so you have to make sure that your donor matches yours or otherwise your body will not recognize it as self will recognize those cells as foreign and attack them okay so another class of immune markers remember this word marker in cell biology and immunology just means something sticking off the surface of a cell some kind of a receptor usually made out of proteins okay some other uh, another important category of markers besides the MHC molecules are these what are called the CD molecules. CD just stands for cluster of differentiation. I don't even know what that means. It's a stupid naming system, but it's just a naming system that's used in the field of immunology. So if you ever like have to read an immunology paper or go to an Im immunology conference or talk, it's just gonna sound like a bunch of numbers. Like people will be like CD3, CD4, CD26, CD100. Like there's so many different CD markers and that's what they, used to identify different immune cells. When people are studying immunology, they have to have a way to isolate and identify different classes of immune cells, and they do that by looking for these different CD markers. So the three that I want you to know that are really important and come up a lot um, that you should be familiar with are CD3, CD4, and CD8. So any cell that has a CD3 marker, that is a T cell marker, and there's like a bunch of different classes of T cells. We'll talk about T helper and cytotoxic T cells. There's also regulatory T cells. Um, there's a, and there's subcategories in each of those. So, but if it has a CD3 marker on its surface, it is a T cell. All of those different types of T cells have CD3. So CD3 means you have a T cell. Um, CD4, if it has a CD4 marker, that means it's a T helper cell. And if it has a CD8 marker, that means it's a cytotoxic T cell. And these are two classes or categories of T cells that we're going to talk a lot about. So this picture here shows you that a CD4 positive T cell is also known as a T helper cell. A CD8 positive T cell is also known as a cytotoxic T cell right? And both of them also have a CD3 complex because all T cells have CD3. All right, so that's it for different markers. So now let's just look at these two different types of lymphocytes in more detail. Let's zoom in on them. The two lymphocytes that are important for adaptive immunity are B cells and T cells. So these two pictured here are both naive. They haven't been activated yet, meaning they nobody has, has um, exposed them to antigen yet. All right, so let's look at what is on the surface of these. So both of them have these receptors, these um, antigen binding uh, markers, right? So the B cell receptor looks what, like, a, it's shaped like a Y, it really is. Um, molecularly. If we zoom in on it here, okay, this is just called the B cell receptor. And these B cell receptors, when the cell is activated, they can actually start secreting these things. And that's what antibodies are. Antibodies are, are secreted B cell receptors, or another word for antibody is an immunoglobulin, all right, or an Ig for short. All right, so it's got a uh, two long chains and two short chains and then this yellow region here this is the part that varies from b cell to b cell so that each one recognizes a different antigen all right another thing that b cells have is an mhc class 2 receptor b cells can actually 
do a little bit of phagocytosis and antigen presentation. So they do, they are professional antigen presenters, but they're not the main ones, sort of a side function of them. The T cells all have CD3 receptors, whether it's a T helper cell or a cytotoxic T cell, and then they will have another CD receptor, either CD4 or CD8 are the two that we're going to focus on. And then it has an additional receptor, the T cell receptor, and these are the receptors that actually recognize antigen. So the T cell receptor looks something like this. It's much smaller than the B cell receptor, and unlike the B cell receptor, which can be secreted as antibodies, the T cell receptor always stays on the surface of the cell. It never gets secreted. All right. I have posed a question here. Do either of these guys have MHC class 1 receptors? Hopefully you answered yes, because all cells have MHC class 1 receptors, except red blood cells. That's right. Good. Okay, let's move my face again. Alrighty, so this, we've talked about in detail, lymphocyte development, how those B cells and T cells develop, um, and what's on their surface once they are developed. Now it's time for them to go out into the world and become activated, and they get activated when they are presented with antigen. So the thing is, B cells and T cells, they can't just recognize antigen floating around the body. That's not their job. Um, they have to be presented with it. And this is just a really nice diagram um, showing sort of this overall response. And then I'm going to, of course, go into detail with each step. So let's back up to the first and second lines of defense. All right. You get a cut or you get a, a splinter in your finger. All right. So the piece of wood goes through the epithelial barrier. That's the first line of defense. All right. Then the bacteria from that splinter get gobbled up by phagocytes, which are part of the second line of defense. Both the first and second lines of defense are considered part of our innate immunity because we are born with them. Innate means something that you naturally have, you're born with. So we have these things. They don't have to be trained. They don't have to be developed. They just are already there. Okay. So some of these phagocytes, this green one is a macrophage, and this purplish one here is something called a dendritic cell, which has a lot of long pseudopod arms. All right. These two, you'll notice, have this little a uh, receptor arm sticking off of them, okay? After they gobble up bacteria, they can then take those little pieces of chewed up bacteria or virus or whatever and display them, hold them out in these little MHC class two receptors. All right, so then they go and they find a T cell and they present antigen to the T cell. The T cell gets activated and that it runs off and it activates B cells, which can then mature into plasma cells, which produce antibodies. And those T cells can also become activated themselves and have their own functions, T cell functions. So notice that the innate immune response takes place in minutes to hours. It's very quick. It's right away. You get a splinter and within a, you know, it's already hurting. And within a few hours, it's red and swollen and hot. All right, those are all the cytokines produced by the innate immune system. But potentially, some of those cells could go on and present antigen to the um, adaptive immune system. Like maybe if that bacteria is staphylococcus and your, your innate immune cells are not able to kill it, and completely kill it and it's starting to move into the tissues and cause a deeper infection all right then some of those um, macrophages are going to get absorbed or, or um, uh, what's the word they're going to travel through the lymphatics to the lymph node where they'll find a bunch of lymphocytes to activate and that takes a while though it takes a couple of days up to a week really before you're producing antibodies towards a particular pathogen this is why when you get sick it usually takes a little while to get over the disease because it takes your adaptive immune system some time to sort of ramp up there's a lot of work that has to go on so 
antigen presentation, my analogy for this is it's kind of like um, you can think of your lymphocytes, your B and T cells, sort of like, um, not drug dogs, what do you call it? Like, um, like canines, canine cops, you know, that like search for, they could be trained to like search for drugs or in this example, I'm going to show you to search for a criminal um, or a person, a missing person. All right. So um, the dog first thing you have to do if you want your dog to go search and find something your trained dog is you have to give them something with the right scent on it so you have to train them to the scent so if you're looking for a missing person or an escaped criminal you need a piece of clothing or something from that person you give it to the dog to sniff all right that's sort of what antigen presentation is the antigen presenting cells give the b and t cells something to sniff so they know what to look for then once the dog knows what to look for or the bnt cells know what to look for they go around search for it and ultimately find and take it down this is actually a, a picture from um, a few years ago the danamora outbreak this was uh, one of the um, prisoners that was caught okay so uh, how this happens in the immune system this big purple cell here is a dendritic cell which is kind of like a macrophage it's a phagocyte um, or it could be a macrophage, and it phagocytosis. I always do this move when I'm phagocytosing. I don't know why. And um, it, like for this microbe, let's say it's a bacteria, all right, it um, engulfs it, it digests it, and then it presents those little pieces, which are antigens, all right, um, using its MHC class 2 markers. So now it's presenting antigen so any cell that can do this that can phagocytose and then present antigen in an mhc class 2 we call them professional antigen presenting cells or apcs and the three most common ones are macrophages dendritic cells or dcs and also b cells can do it as well um but mac i'm just going back macrophages and dendritic cells remember are part of the innate immune system. They're phagocytes of the second line of defense. So the second line of defense and the third line of defense really are connected. There's a connection. It's sort of a chain reaction. Okay, so um, moving my face around. So now this DC, this dendritic cell or macrophage, is it has antigen to present. It's going to go find a T cell, specifically something called a T helper cell, a CD4 T cell, all right? And the CD4 T cell, um, the T cell receptor, the CD3, and the CD4 marker all together recognize that MHC class 2 marker. They all fit together really snugly like a puzzle, all right? Assuming that this T cell has a T cell receptor that matches that antigen. So you can't, it can't just find any old T cell. It has to find a T cell that matches that antigen. And that can take a little while. Again, why the adaptive immune response takes some time. So now that it has found this T cell, when it makes that connection, it also will secrete um, cytokines. And I don't care, you don't need to know these. These, what these cytokines are, but IL-1, interleukin-1, and interleukin-2 are basically growth factors and stimulating factors. They basically get that um, T cell activated. And so now this T helper cell, it's called a T helper cell because now its job is to go help other cells get activated. So that's what it's going to do. This slide's a little bit complicated. Where should I put my face? I will put my face down here. Okay, so either way, we've got, um, so this side is showing us uh, B cells and what their functions are, and the right side is showing us T cells and their functions, all right? So first stage, you have um, antigen, or you have a microbe come in, and a macrophage or dendritic cell engulfs it and presents antigen on the surface. So this one, it's getting engulfed, now it's getting presented, all right? This antigen presenting cell will present that antigen to a T helper cell, all right? The T helper cell can then 
act become activated, an activated T cell. Um, but it also can go and activate naive B cells. All right, the B cells, when they get activated, there's really only one thing they do. When they become activated, they turn into plasma cells, which are basically just antibody production factories, and they just spit out a bunch of antibodies. All right, some of those activated B cells will differentiate into memory cells. These guys, their job is to just hang out long term like forever in your body and so that if you ever see that antigen again they can very quickly turn into plasma cells and make antibodies another thing the t-cells can do once they are activated is they can um, stimulate uh, other types of t-cells so they can stimulate more t-helper cells they can also stimulate cytotoxic t-cells and they can stimulate t-regulatory cells they can also form memory T cells so that again, if you ever see that antigen again, this response is going to happen a lot more quickly. So <clears throat> um, when a B or T cell is presented with antigen, that is when it becomes activated. Another way we say that is when you challenge it with antigen. All right, so when you challenge it, that's when it starts to go through. That's basically you're selecting it. When we talked about the different stages of lymphocyte development, clonal selection. So you're selecting the clone that has the right receptor that actually matches that antigen. And it starts to proliferate and can either produce memory cells that last forever or effector cells that actually like start doing stuff right away. B cells and T cells have totally different jobs and different functions. B cells produce antibodies and we call that humoral immunity. And T cells have a few different functions. We're going to talk about their function as helpers, as cytotoxic killers, and as regulators. But all of the T cell functions are called cell mediated immune responses. So we're going to start with the T cell responses. All right, T cell responses are also known as cell mediated immunity. And there's a whole bunch of different types of T cells. I, as I mentioned before, there's T helper cells. There's actually two types of T helper cells, T helper one and T helper two. Oh, and there's also T helper 17. Not gonna get into that in this class. I mean, immunology is a subject that has its own, there could be a whole course on immunology alone. So we're just gonna focus on the fact that there's T helper cells and their job is basically to stimulate other cells, to activate other cells, to activate B cells, and to activate especially those cytotoxic T cells. Um, cytotoxic T cells, you'll see the term cytotoxic means deadly to cells, toxic or poisonous to cells. They literally produce poisons to kill cells, not bacterial cells, but body cells. They're killing infected cells. And then regulatory cells are really important. Their job is to actually turn the immune system off once the threat is over. Because if you just keep um, producing cytotoxic cells and you just your, those cells will go crazy and start killing cells for no reason. So you have to have some regulatory element that sort of shuts everyone down once the threat is gone. All right. So these T helper cells, when they get activated by antigen presentation, all right, they can differentiate and stimulate um, all these other kinds of T cells. So the T helper cells, this is a really complicated picture. I don't love it. The T helper cells um, can activate B cells, all right, which then will produce antibodies um, or become mem memory cells themselves. They can become... Uh, memory cells, memory T cells, or those T cells can become regulatory T cells. And those regulatory T cells actually dampen or turn down the immune response when it's no longer needed. Notice in this slide also that B cells also make memory, memory cells. So these cytotoxic T cells, um, they do need to be activated. They are activated um, by different receptors than the T helper cells. So their activation requires presentation by a T helper cell using the T, um, 
Oh, no, sorry, sorry. I take it back. They are activated by T helper cells, but once they are activated, they go around and they're looking for infected cells. So the receptors they're looking for are MHC class 1 molecules that are presenting the correct antigen. Because remember, MHC class 1 is on all cells. So you have a skin cell that's infected, it's going to be presenting antigen in its MHC class 1, which is notifying those cytotoxic T cells that, hey, I'm infected, help me. Really, it's hey, I'm infected, kill me, because that's what's going to happen. Um, and so the, when the cytotoxic T cell finds an infected cell, it, it binds to that MHC class 1 marker that's presenting antigen, and then it starts secreting these proteins called perforins and granzymes, which basically both poke holes in the cell and cause the cell to do something called apoptosis, which is the cell's form of suicide, basically. It's a cascade of proteins that causes the cell to self-destruct. So mm, not a pretty story, but you know, you got to sacrifice those infected cells to save the rest of the cells around them. Um, there's other T cells. Like I said, there's so many different classes of T cells. We're not going to get into all of them. I'm not even going to get into any of these. The only one that I wanted to feature here that's cool to mention, but not necessarily microbiology related, are the natural killer cells. And these ones are especially um, good at identifying and killing cancer cells. So these are a class of cells that are very heavily studied by um, immunologists who work with cancer. So just to remember, not we that the immune system um, fights off microbes and pathogens, but also fights off cancer. Alrighty, so those are T cells. We've got the T helpers, which help everyone else get activated, and the cytotoxic T cells, which kill infected cells. And together, oh, and then there's the regulatory T cells which calm everyone down when the response is over, all right? And all of those T cell responses are collectively known as cell-mediated immunity. Now for the B cell responses. The B cell responses are called humoral immunity. And what B cells are more simple. When they get activated by a T helper cell, um, they differentiate. They can form regulatory B cells, which again, any regulatory cell is going to sort of shut things down when the, when the threat is over. Um, memory B cells, which hang around forever and keep a memory of this infection, of this antigen, so that it can respond much faster in the future. And effector cells. The effector cells of the B cell variety are called plasma cells, and they basically are just antibody-producing factories. They just pump out lots and secrete lots of immunoglobulins or antibodies. All right, so antibodies, we sort of saw them already. They're the same structure as the B cell receptor. So there's two um, what we call heavy chains. These long chains are the two heavy chains, and then the short chains are the two light chains. I like to think of it as a Y-shaped protein with two arms and a trunk. All right, the trunk portion is called the FC portion. All right, the trunk is the FC. The arms are called the FAB, F-A-B portion. F-A-B stands for fraction that bind, fraction that run, antigen binding, the antigen binding fraction, I think is what F-A-B stands for. This is the part of the antibody that actually binds to the antigen. Here's the antigen um, receptor site right there. And here's the antigen and the little epitope on the antigen that the antibody here um, recognizes. All right, the yellow regions are labeled with a V. That's because they are the variable regions. Remember we said that genetically lymphocytes do some recombination. They mix and match so that every time they produce a, an immunoglobulin B cell receptor, one of these things, each the variable region is different for every B cell. The constant region, the C, which is in like maroon color, that's the same across all B cells. Okay, 
So the FC region, this trunk region, the constant region, at the bottom of it is um, sort of a sequence, I guess, or a structure that phagocytes recognize. They are really attracted to this um, region, and they have they have receptors for this trunk region, and will actually bind to it. So anything that an antibody is stuck to is basically food for phagocytes. I like to think of antibodies as sort of sprinkles that make things look much more delicious to phagocytes. Um, do, do, do. Okay, so phagocytes, so I, I guess I should say there's different types of phagocytes, right? So like macrophages um, really look for a specific type of antibody called IgG. Um, cells of the immune, or sorry, of the allergic response of allergy our basophils and mast cells, we'll talk about in the next chapter, recognize a different class of antibody, which is called IgE. All right, um, so oh, I'll talk about the different classes of antibodies, but first I'll talk about the different functions of antibodies. So there's a lot of things that antibodies can do. The sprinkle analogy um, is, what, is what's called opsonization. So one thing that antibodies can do is they can coat or they can bind to all over the surface of a bacteria or a virus and just make it look really delicious for macrophages. So the macrophages come, bind to that antibody and, and swallow up the bacteria and eat it. So the opsonization just means to candy, I like to think of it as candy coating something with antibodies. Or we, we, we also saw this word opsonize when we talked about complement, that protein that's part of the innate immune system. It can also do this, can candy coat or cover the surface of a bacteria and attract phagocytes. Um, another thing that, that can happen when you have antibodies surrounding a um, bacteria or a virus is that you can neutralize it. In other words, you block all the surface receptors so that it cannot adhere to the cells that it needs to get into. You're physically blocking it and preventing it from getting into cells. So that's called neutralization. You can also neutralize toxins, toxins that are produced by bacteria, for example. Um, for example, tetanus. Tetanus produces a toxin, it's a neurotoxin, and the tetanus vaccine is actually just contains that toxin, not the bacteria. And so your body generates antibodies just to that toxin. And so if you're exposed to the toxin, your antibodies will neutralize it, completely bind it up so that it can't actually bind to the proteins and receptors in your body that it would inhibit. Um, another thing that can that antibodies can do is they can attach to multiple bacteria or virus particles and cause them to sort of clump together. That's called agglutination, this sort of clumping effect. I like to think of it as sort of handcuffing the bacteria, like you handcuff a criminal um, and then they can't move. So you're sort of immobilizing them by sticking them all together through this agglutination. And then finally, another thing that antibodies can do is they can work to recruit those complement proteins. Remember, complement can help to opsonize, but the other job of complement was it could make those MAC attacks, those hole punchers. And so the antibodies can basically be like, hey, complement, come over here. I got a bacteria for you to poke a hole in. And complement does. So, as I mentioned before, there are different classes of antibodies or immunoglobulins. There's five, and um, the I think the um, mnemonic that my students came up with last year was GAMED, G-A-M-E-D. Um, so, the bold line is actually probably a good a good thing to memorize for each one. So. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about them in the order that they are produced. So I'm going to start with IgM. So I, when you have an infection, if you have strep throat, let's say, okay, um, you'll go through, the, the bacteria goes through the first line of defense, gets through the mucous membrane, colonizes, stimulates inflammation, the second line of defense. So you got cytokine production, you've got a red, sore throat, um, maybe you get a fever, 
and and you've got tons of phagocytes that are just trying to they're eating up that uh, those streptococcus bacteria and then they go and to the lymph nodes and your lymph nodes get swollen you get lymphedema and um, the that is because your antigen presenting cells are presenting strep antigens to the B cells and T cells the lymphocytes in your lymph nodes specifically to the T helper cells now those T helper cells are going to go stimulate and activate your B cells and your B cells will then start pumping out antibodies they'll they'll turn into plasma cells which are antibody factories and the first antibody that they churn out is called IgM and it's actually five immunoglobulins that are linked together so we say that it is pentavalent it has five um, it looks kind of like a snowflake shape all right and that's the first antibody that's made um, I think of M for when I think of M I think of immature a little bit so it's like it's the first sorry it's the first um, sort of immature antibody that's produced and while it's producing IgM it's tweaking the antibodies a little bit trying to find ones that work a little bit better and so after it does sort of the first draft of IgM production that plasma cell will go through a, a class switch and it'll switch to making the um, better antibody which is IgG IgG antibodies also can stay in your blood and circulate in your blood for a long time so that if you're infected again you already have those antibodies there so in an infection the first antibodies that are made are IgM then the second antibodies that are made and made in more abundance and are just sort of better longer lasting antibodies are the IgG class all right um I'm just going to switch to this slide for a quick second to show you that IgM and IgG so in an infection um, the first time you have an infection all right so you're exposed to a microbe and its antigens here all right it takes a while so first line of defense second line of defense innate immunity has to do its thing before it can stimulate the adaptive response so then once the adaptive response there's sort of a lag period like a week or so before you start producing any antibodies purple is total antibody production but red here that's the first antibody you're producing that's the IgM so IgM production goes up but then it falls down because you start making IgG instead all right but then when the infection is cleared the IgG antibody also may go down all right the second time you're exposed to the antigen right here all right notice that you get antibody production right away so those memory B cells that are floating around they see the antigen and they start pumping out antibodies right away not IgM antibodies but IgG antibodies and this time those IgG antibodies stay around and they stay in your blood and you have them long term this is why a lot of vaccines require boosters because sometimes after the first the first shot your first exposure you get memory cells but you don't get memory antibodies after a second challenge you activate those memory cells and you get those memory antibodies so a lot of times if you've been vaccinated or you can't remember if you've been vaccinated a doctor can check your antibody levels to see if you have and if you did mount an antibody response so that's what they how they can check to see if the vaccine worked um, just because you have the antibodies doesn't mean you won't ever get sick with that disease but that's that's how they define whether or not um, you they call it zero conversion okay so back to the other classes of antibodies so um, IgA is an antibody that's secreted it's found in secretory fluid so in your mucus like um, in your respiratory tract your snot contains IgA so it's there to help trap and bind to any microbes it's also produced in your gut and it's also secreted in breast milk and is thought to play a slight a little bit of a protective role in um, the guts of babies who are breastfed 
So IgA is a secreted antibody. It is bivalent, so it's made of two immunoglobulins stuck together. Um, IgD is sort of like the least important and least interesting one. This one is the permanent B cell receptor. So it's the form that's not secreted ever. So it's found on naive B cells that the B cell receptor is basically in the form of IgD. All right, and then IgE is the allergy antibody and we'll see it a lot in chapter 14. But G, A, and M are the three most important ones in terms of infection. M being the first one that's made, G being the sort of more mature one that's made and that stays circulating, and A is really important in secretions, mucus, saliva, semen, breast milk, etc. So the cool thing about antibody memory is that you have it, that after um, two exposures to an antigen, you will have circulating antibodies in your blood that are already there to attack if that antigen returns. Um, and so you can measure people's antibody levels and by doing so can see what they've either been vaccinated against or been infected with. And a few years ago, this lab came out with a really cool um, technique or method of literally um, identifying every virus you've ever been infected with with just one drop of your blood. So just taking a sample of one drop of blood, they could do sequencing. They could look for, um, well, they, it, they could do um, basically map out the antibodies in that drop of blood and match it to antibodies that match those antibodies to different viruses. And so like the blocks that are red are ones that you have a lot of antibodies to, meaning that you've been infected either recently or you were infected in the past and you have a lot of memory antibodies. And the ones that are in blue would be ones that you have never been exposed to and you don't have any antibodies to. So it's kind of um, a cool technique and could be, used to potentially identify viral infections that may trigger chronic diseases that we haven't exactly found a cause for yet. So for example, um, it's thought that um, certain adenoviruses might contribute to the development of type 1 diabetes, the kind that is the autoimmune version of um, diabetes. And by testing bunches of people with type 1 diabetes, they may be able to identify a virus that is unique, a viral infection that was unique to that population, and um, be able to figure out what virus is actually contributing to type 1 diabetes, which would be really cool. Alrighty, so um, immunity is basically forming a memory immune response to something. <clears throat> and there's different ways that we can do that. I've already alluded to vaccines and infections, and those are two ways that we can acquire immunity. So having an infection um, and then becoming immune to that pathogen is called natural immunity. But um, getting a vaccine is a form of artificial immunity. So you still develop the immunity, but it wasn't through a natural course, it was through an artificial um, in introduction of antigen. When, and I, either way, vaccine or an infection stimulate active immunity. They activate, not, they activate your B and T cells to make memory cells and make a memory response. Passive immunity is basically when you give someone antibodies through a transfusion as sort of a treatment to um, to treat them for something. Another form of passive immunity is going to be passing on antibodies through the blood and the breast milk from mother to fetus and mother to infant. So when a woman is growing a fetus, there's some blood sharing going on, including um, antibodies from the mother's blood get passed into the developing infant's blood. So they presumably have similar <clears throat> um, antibody immunity as their mom and they come out 
Those antibodies don't last forever, though. They wear off with time, which is why it's important to get babies vaccinated so they can build their own active immunity because the passive immunity that they gain from their mother is only temporary. I guess that's another way, thing to say. Passive immunity is temporary. Active immunity is going to be long, long term. So this was just a little sorting activity. Um, I have four different scenarios here. This is a guy with a cold. Um, this is a vial of tetanus antitoxin, so basically antibodies against the tetanus toxin. This is a person getting a vaccine, <clears throat> and this is a mother breastfeeding. So take a minute and decide where you would put each of these. Are they natural or artificial? Are they active? or passive. <clears throat> okay, time's up. So if you have an infection, that's natural. That would be type of natural immunity. And um, it would be stimulating, activating your immune cells. So that would be natural active immunity. So that guy can go in this box. Um, tetanus antitoxin. This is an artificial product. It's not natural. So um, We'll put it under artificial immunity, and it doesn't actually activate your immune system. It's just sort of supplements your immune system. It's just antibodies that you can give to someone to help them uh, get better from tetanus. So that would be artificial passive immunity. The vaccine is artificial, so it goes up here, and it but it does stimulate your immune system and your memory response, so it is active. And then the mother breastfeeding um, is giving, she's passing on antibodies through her breast milk, primarily IgA antibodies, but it's a natural process. So that would be a type of natural passive immunity. Those are kinds of questions I could ask on a test, like which of the following is an example of natural passive immunity? <clears throat> um, Alrighty, so we're talking one of the most important developments in modern healthcare and modern history has been the development of artificial active immunity in the form of vaccines. So the goal of a vaccine is to stimulate active immunity without actually causing disease. So natural immunity is great, except for the fact that you get sick. And also except for the fact that sometimes when you get sick, you die or have other really unfortunate sequelae and if you can avoid that that's the the best you know scenario to get immunity without getting the disease or death from disease so um vaccinations actually a very very old process the first um, cases of it or the first um, recorded history was back in 900 bc all right before christ so that was like I don't know, 3,000 years ago. And um, it was in China. And smallpox, I mean, smallpox is an ancient virus and, and it's always been very deadly. And um, people were known to do this practice known as variolation, where they would take someone who had smallpox and they'd basically scratch the smallpox until it like bled or oozed. And then they would take that ooze and cut another person, like give them a little cut and then rub that smallpox ooze into their wound and that was called variolation and it was a form of inoculation except the problem is a lot of times that person uh who had been variolated would develop smallpox and die so it was not very safe but um when it worked it worked i guess it's kind of similar to like chicken pox parties that we people would do basically they would just try to get smallpox try to get a weaker version of it somehow and hope that they recovered and then were immune to it all right but the first safe smallpox vaccine was invented by um jenner why am i forgetting his first name oh well jenner edward edward jenner um back in 1970 sorry 1796 and um edward jenner made this really interesting observation the first step of the scientific method is always always observation and um, his observation was that milkmaids who were often um 
very beautiful. In other words, they didn't have scars on their face like a lot of people of the time did because of smallpox scars. And he noticed that milkmaids didn't have them. They had really nice skin, smooth skin. They did sometimes though have um, pox on their hands that they would catch when they milked the cows because they would catch cowpox. And so he hypothesized that getting cowpox from a cow made you immune to smallpox in humans. And so he basically took some cow, like lanced a cowpox, took that fluid, put it in a syringe and injected it into people. And it worked. It did not give them cowpox um, because the cowpox virus just, uh, human tissue is not similar enough to cow tissue for the virus to cause disease, but it was similar enough to the smallpox virus um, it had enough similar antigens that the immune response that was elicited in humans was protective against smallpox. So we talk about sometimes in this class the whole anti-vaccine movement, um, and it's not actually a new and modern thing. It's been in existence as long as vaccines have. So this is a political cartoon back in the, in the late 1700s. Um, this is supposed to be Jenner giving shots to people, cow, you know, um, cowpox shots, basically. And these are all people who have had theirs already. And you can see they're like sprouting cows out of their arms and legs and armpits and that they're turning into cows. And so it was there was this fear that by injecting cowpox, you would start growing cow parts or turning into a cow. So throughout the history of vaccines, there's been um, misinformation and ignorance that's led to fear uh, and superstition sort of surrounding the safety of vaccines. Um, the reason it's called a vaccine, by the way, vaca is the Latin word for cow. So since the first vaccine was for cowpox, that's why Edward Jenner called it, he called it a vaccine. The, it's the cowpox vaccine, but that term vaccine has sort of carried through and now we call all of inoculations, no matter what the disease is, we call it a vaccine. But literally the word means has to do with cows and cowpox. Okay, so Jenner's vaccine was so successful that after using it for 200 years all over the world, we actually eradicated smallpox as a disease from the planet. So in the 19, late 1970s, we actually stopped vaccinating people for smallpox. A few select populations do still get vaccinated, um, like military personnel, due to a fear of, of smallpox being developed as like a bioterrorism weapon. Um, but as a disease that spreads from person to person, it no longer exists. So we no longer need to get regularly vaccinated like during our childhood vaccinations for it, which is great and is the goal really of all vaccines or many vaccines that if we can use them and eradicate the disease, then we won't need the vaccine anymore. So vaccines are incredibly successful. I mean, the basic principle of them is to stimulate an immune response without causing disease um, and to stimulate an immune response that is long lasting, that creates memory. Um, and they have profoundly affect health. I think I showed this same slide in an earlier lecture earlier in the semester, but this big orange bubble here is measles, like the most contagious disease there is. So it spreads quickly. And back in 19, early 1900s, there were mm, 530,000 cases a year. And I don't know what the total population of the United States was back then, but not nearly as many, because that's probably a pretty large percent. Um, lots and lots of cases of measles. Now, only a handful of cases. And then this slide now is 10 years ago, but even still currently, I think now, I think currently, I think this year there have actually been a couple hundreds of cases. Again, because of dropping vaccine rates, the number of measles is actually going up. It was only 61 cases in 2010. There were actually zero cases of measles in 2007. We had um, eliminated it from the US, but it came back because of dropping vaccination rates and travel. Um, so vaccines have hugely reduced the burden of disease. 
of these infectious diseases and could potentially wipe them off the face of the planet if we can get enough people vaccinated and prevent the spread uh, and prevent basically minimize the number of hosts for these different microbes. So some different categories of vaccines. Vaccines can be made either using whole virus or bacterial particles or parts of the virus or bacterial particles. So a whole cell vaccine can be either live or dead um, or weakened. So the live ones are not going to be like like full virulent strains. They'll be weakened or what we call attenuated strains of a virus or a bacteria. So they'll get in, they might be able to like, you know, divide a couple of times in your body, but then they conk out um, and they succumb very easily to the immune response. So some examples of live attenuated vaccines, um, measles is a live attenuated vaccine, um, measles virus. Uh, the, the flu mist, when we did do the flu mist, which I don't think is around anymore, that was a live attenuated flu vaccine. Um, live vaccines work, tend to elicit a stronger immune response because they are actually replicating, they're, they're made of whole cells, and so there's more antigens for the immune system to form a response to. Some viruses or bacteria are just too virulent, you can't risk having a, a live form of it, so you just kill it or inactivate it in the case of a virus. Then there's also such a thing as subunit vaccines, and these just use parts like surface antigens, basically, from the bacteria or from the virus, or maybe they are just containing toxins um, from them. So the those are common common pieces or subunits to use. Viral spike proteins, like so for example, the Ebola vaccine that's being clinically tested right now is not, it's not um, a whole Ebola virus. It's just some of the proteins, the surface proteins from the Ebola virus. Um, uh, the, I already mentioned tetanus, tetanus vaccine is just contains the tetanus toxin, not the tetanus bacteria, so that your body can produce an immune response to that toxin. All right, um, there are, there is of course development of new vaccines, but it's tough because um, vaccine development is very expensive and there's not always funding for that. Pharmaceutical, it's not a very profitable arm of the pharmaceutical companies because it prevents disease. You only get the shot once or, you know, maybe three times, you get a couple of boosters, and that's the only doses you need of that drug for your whole life. And then it prevents you from using other drugs from that company because you don't get sick with that disease. Um, so there's a, a big need to develop more vaccines. They're like one of the most effective pharmaceuticals out there biggest lifesaver in terms of the pharmaceutical market, um, and yet there's not as much money going into developing them as maybe other drugs for things like cancer. There's also certain microbes that we would love to have a vaccine to, and we've tried very hard, but they're just very clever, and they're very good at antigen shifting, changing their surface proteins, and they're very evasive, including HIV and malaria which they've been trying to develop a vaccine for for years and have had multiple failed trials. There's also an area of vaccine research looking to make cancer vaccines, and they're actually getting really close in that department. So um, basically ways to stimulate the immune system to recognize better recognize cancer or specific cancers. Um, so in, in this list of difficulties, the fact that it's not very profitable is a problem. And also another problem with vaccines can be distributing them, especially if they need to be like refrigerated, if they have a short shelf life. So some of the ingredients that you'll hear about in vaccines that a lot of the anti-vaccine movement um, harps on are things that act as preservatives so that the vaccine has a longer shelf life so that it can be distributed to you know, developing countries with poor transportation and that it can get to people in hard to reach areas and not degrade on the way there. Another important, I'm not going to get into DNA vaccines, 
Um, I'll come back to that. Another important ingredient in vaccines is the component that's known as the adjuvant. Okay, so an adjuvant is something that I like to say it sort of tickles the immune system or triggers it. So let's think about what a vaccine is, right? It's like dead, some dead bacteria, okay? If you inject some dead bacteria into your arm, your immune cell is going to take one look at that and be like, yeah, that's not a threat. We don't need to, we don't need to waste all this energy and mount an immune response and a bunch of antibodies and take days to prepare this response for a couple of dead bacteria. Those things are harmless. All right. So what the adjuvant is, it's a, it's an ingredient that basically irritates the immune system and jars it into action. I think of my analogies kind of like a fire drill. Okay. So like if there is a fire in class, like if we were in class right now and I was like, Oh, Hey guys, it, there's a fire. We should go. You'd probably look at me like, are you serious? Huh? I don't, I, I don't see an emergency. I, I'm going to stay put. Thanks. But if there's an alarm blaring and there's people running through the hall, like fire drill, everyone get up, get out, then you're going to do it. Even though, you know, it's just a drill and there's no real threat, you're still going to go through the paces because there's all these alarms going off and they're basically making you do it. Right? So the adjuvant is like the fire alarm that says, I know there's not a threat here, immune system, but you better get yourself together and mount an immune response to this thing because it could be dangerous next time. So the adjuvant is a really important component of the vaccine. Without it, the vaccine would just be a dud. It wouldn't work. And it's another component that people who are hesitant about vaccines often focus on. A very common adjuvant are alum. It's called alum or it's an aluminum salt. And again, it's just irritating to the local tissue and it stimulates immune cells. It does not build up aluminum. It's a very small amount of aluminum and it doesn't build up in your body and it's not toxic. Um, but it is necessary to stimulate that immune response. So there are also different ways to introduce a vaccine into the body. And the most common way is via needle, either subcutaneous under the skin into the sort of fat tissue or intramuscular. And different vaccines have different administration. And it's basically just the size of the needle and the site where you inject it is different. Um, some all there's, so that's like, I would say like 90% of vaccines fall in the injection uh, department. There was for a time a, a, a spray, a nasal spray version of the flu vaccine that was called flu mist, but um, they, they tweaked the formula and the efficacy and the effectiveness of it went way down. So they took it back to the lab to, work on it. So it's, it's, I don't think it's been in production for a couple of years. There's also um, a couple of oral vaccines. The one that's given to babies in the U.S. is the rotavirus vaccine, which is nice because no one likes to give their babies shots, but babies have no problem drinking a couple of drops of, you know, like the juice flavored, some probably probably sweet flavored rotavirus vaccine. Um, another one that's an oral vaccine, there's a, an oral version of the polio vaccine, but it's not administered in the US. It's a live vaccine, and in a small percentage of cases, it can actually revert back to a pathogenic strain, and so it's not considered safe enough to use in developed countries. It is more effective, and it's still used in a lot of developing countries um, fortunately or unfortunately, and sometimes does result in cases of polio. Um, the nice thing about these alternative routes is they, they actually, so a rotavirus is a gastrointestinal virus, so it makes sense to have an oral route of administration. Flu is a respiratory virus. It makes sense to have a respiratory route of administration. It's just not possible with all different types of, of microbes and vaccines. All right, so vaccines do have side effects. Um, if it's an injection, you most often will have reactions at that site. So you may have swelling, definitely have tenderness, pain at the injection site. You may develop a fever. 
because a fever is part of the innate immune system working. You develop that, those cytokines and those pyrogens get produced. That is actually a sign that the vaccine is working, that your immune system is mounting a response. Some people have allergic reactions to vaccines, and those can be mild, like a rash, or they can be serious, like anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis happens very quickly, within a few minutes after having a shot. So if you're ever worried, have anxiety about that happening, the advice is usually just stay at the doctor's office, you know, for 15, 20 minutes afterwards. And then if someone does have an allergic response, there's medical personnel to attend to that. There are very, very, very rare side effects. And in one of the videos that you watch in, in uh, your TED Talk, they do a great sort of visual of this. The, the serious side effects of vaccine preventable diseases, like measles, versus the rare side effects of the um, vaccine are like not even comparable. So um, one thing that is not a side effect of vaccines and has been studied over and over and over, but people still repeat, is that vaccines do not cause autism. Nothing about vaccines, none of, uh, several different vaccines have been tested. There is no connection between vaccines and autism. And the rumor was started by this guy here, Dr. Andrew Wakefield, who in the 90s published a paper saying that the MMR vaccine does cause autism. He did a study that was on like five kids. He was getting paid on the side by pharmaceutical or by lawyers who were trying to sue pharmaceutical companies. It was all very sketchy. His license was actually, his medical license um, was revoked, so he cannot practice medicine anymore, but he's still out there. He's a prominent speaker and promoter of the anti-vaccine movement, and he's kind of a very dangerous person. Um, but he lied, and the problem is that when, when lies and rumors are out there, it's very hard to, like, convince ourselves to, like, remove that impression from our minds. So even though it's been multiple, like proven multiple times that vaccines are not connected to autism, people still think there's that connection. So as um, healthcare educators and healthcare workers that you are all training to be it is part of your job to help um, combat that rumor, right? So when we don't vaccinate, we do pay a price. We've seen this a lot with measles in the last few years um, of getting outbreaks. A really bad outbreak this year was in Samoa. Only like 30% of people were vaccinated. And so there was an outbreak that spread wildly. I think thousands of people died. Um, it was very, it was, it was a very large outbreak of measles. And the only thing that controlled it was vaccination. Another thing that's important for va about vaccines is they provide herd immunity. So when enough people, if you have a bunch of people who are vaccinated and a couple of people who are not vaccinated, all those vaccinated people around them help to prevent them from getting infected. And um, herd immunity is really protective for those individuals who can't get vaccinated. Either they have an autoimmune disease or they're very young infants and they're not old enough to be vaccinated yet. So herd immunity is really important for protecting those vulnerable people. It is not something that people should like elect to not get vaccinated because they depend on herd immunity. Herd immunity will fall apart if people start electing not to vaccinate. So it's only really to protect the small portion of people who can't get vaccinated. Um, so vaccine rates have been dropping partly because of fear of vaccine side effects that are very very rare like some of the ones listed on the previous slide or fear of things that are not vaccine side effects like autism um also uh the fact that a lot of people have not seen these vaccine preventable they haven't seen measles they've never seen a case of measles so why be afraid of measles they're more afraid of their kid getting a shot than they are of their kid getting a case of measles um, and that's because of the success of vaccines they've been so 
successful at preventing disease that people nowadays have no memory of these diseases and no longer fear them. Instead, they fear the vaccines. So I think some of these outbreaks and having more cases might jog people's memories and scare them back into getting vaccines. But the thing is, people are really bad at analyzing statistics and analyzing risk. We are naturally really bad at that. Like for example, a lot of people are afraid to fly in airplanes because they're afraid of their plane crashing, but you're much more likely to die in a car crash than a plane crash, yet people are unreasonably more afraid of flying than they are of driving. It doesn't make any logical sense, but it's how our brains work. And similarly with vaccines, a lot of people are not afraid of the of measles and the side effects of measles, but even though it's way more dangerous than the side effects of the vaccines. Um, psychology for you. So vaccines are recommended um, on a schedule. The CDC puts out a schedule that they recommend for babies to get in the first couple of years of life, and this is just a little diagram of it. It looks like a lot of shots, but some of these shots are combined into a single shot, or some of these um, antigens are combined into a single shot. Some baby appointments you are getting three or four shots at a time, which a lot of parents feel like is a lot and too much to expose their little babies to. But the thing is, um, babies have immune cells, Babies are exposed to, ton, you know, we're all exposed to hundreds, maybe thousands of antigens on a daily basis just from eating and breathing and babies putting toys and stuff in their mouth. They're getting germs in their body that they're mounting immune responses to. So um, exposing them to a handful of antigens and a few vaccines is, is not overwhelming for their immune system. Um, it is overwhelming, I think, as a mom, I found it very, and as somebody who's a needle phobe, it is really scary taking your baby in for shots. So it really, I think, requires a good, solid understanding and appreciation for the protective effect of vaccines in order to get over that anxiety about giving them to your baby. So as um, future nurses and future healthcare providers, people who will be potentially giving vaccines, to babies and dealing with parents who are anxious, I encourage you to treat them with empathy and understanding because it is very anxiety, a very anxious time. And um, lecturing them or making them feel guilty for not wanting to get a vaccine can just make them run further away from them. So holding their hands, giving them the support that they need in order to um, protect their children to the best of medical ability um, is, is I think an important, an important job in today's world of healthcare. Oh, and, um, and I have one of the TED Talks that you will watch is from a nurse who kind of promotes this, this sort of um, patient education. Okay, that was a really long lecture, but I'm done now. Bye.